When people think about worship and work, first of all, you need to overcome a negative view of work, that work is a curse. So those who work, and particularly because of our heritage of slavery, the slaves were put to work and made to work hardest. People grew up with the desire not to work. So not to work was seen as being in a better position as those who are working. So there's a big, big need to see a work not as just responding to some slave master, fulfilling somebody else's goals and objectives, but being part of shaping creation's beauty, shaping creation's values, and taking care of God's creations as stewards. So work was, was seen as a negative part, and avoidance of work was seen as a goal of life, uh, whether it's through corruption or through just not doing any work. So there, there needs to be a new understanding of the theology of work, what work means in God's economy. The most important things that Christians need to know is that work is not a result of the fall. It's not a result of the curse that sin has brought on us and on God's creation. That work was a mandate from God before the fall. That God put us in His creation to finish or to help fulfill what He started. Um, and that won't be fully restored until He returns. But when we view work in that way, I think it's incredibly empowering to know that I play some role in that. Uh, whether I'm a stay-at-home mom, whether I'm an accountant, or whether I do something that may seem, in a secular sense, may, much more glamorous, whether I'm a CEO of a large company. Uh, if God has called us to it, it is part of His plan, His design for His creation. All right, in this lesson, we're going to look at a biblical theology for work and vocation in terms of creation, uh, how God intended things from the very beginning. And, and we're going to start uh, our understanding of these things by looking at God himself, the nature and character of God, and, and what just an understanding of God uh, teaches us and helps us understand about work and vocation. It's not uncommon to hear Christians say that, that work is part of the curse, but nothing could be further from the truth. Work existed before the fall. In fact, God works. In Genesis chapter 1, we read the account of God's creation. And in Genesis 2, 3, it says, God rested from all of his work. So just think about that. God works. He also rests, and that's very significant. But he works. He's a working God. Now let's unpack this even further and see what we can learn about work from God. The first thing I want to say about this is that God is creative. He created the heavens and the earth. He created the stars and the planets and all their amazing diversity of plants and animals. And these things are intricate and they're delicate. They're carefully crafted. They're beautiful. So we can see that God is creative and we can see that he loves diversity. He didn't just create one flower. He didn't create one bird or tree or fish, but a huge variety. In fact, we're still discovering them. We can also see that God loves beauty and harmony and order. His creation works together like a finely tuned symphony orchestra. It works so precisely that amazingly, we're able to describe it mathematically. E always equals mc square. That's amazing. <laughs> now, this has huge implications for us. Why? Because we're made in God's image. Dara's going to unpack this further in the next two lessons, so I won't get into that here. When we look at how God works, we can gain life-changing insights into our work. Let me give you several examples of this. First, how did God create? Well, he spoke. He used words and language. It's fascinating that today science is revealing that at the very core of matter is actually highly complex information, is language. In fact, one human DNA molecule contains enough information to fill a million-page encyclopedia. That's about a thousand books. Psalm 33, 6 through 9 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. Let all the earth fear the Lord, and let the people of the world revere him. 
For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. So what can we learn about from this? Well, first of all, we can learn that words are powerful. They're incredibly powerful. Language is powerful. In fact, some of you may work with words and language. Some of you may be scholars or writers or journalists. So what does this say about the work that you do? Or we could look at Genesis 2, 8 through 9. Now the Lord God planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And he put the man that he had formed there. And the Lord God made all the trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and were good for food. So here's God at work again. But what kind of work? Well, he's working the land. He's planting a garden. He's doing agriculture. Many of you might be farmers or ranchers or conservationists. You also work the land. So what does this mean for the work that you do? Maybe you think it doesn't have any implication. Well, I'm telling you it does. In many countries, those who work the land are considered to be the lowest of the low. They're looked down upon by others in society. But how does this change if we see that the great God and the king over all was a farmer, was a gardener? In fact, this is the work that he does. It changes everything. Or we could look at Psalm 86, verse 11, which says, Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. What kind of work is God doing? He's teaching. He's an educator. What does this say for those of you who are working in education as teachers or administrators or even parents? Think about our calling and work in the home as husbands and wives, as fathers and mothers. In all of these areas, we learn from God. Psalm 103, 13, for example, we read, The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. Or in Isaiah 66, verses 12 and 13, For this is what the Lord says, I will extend peace like a river. You will nurse and be carried on her arm and dandled on her knee as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. We can learn what it means to be a mother and a father from looking at God himself. Or we could look at Isaiah 9, 6. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. God's a counselor. Perhaps you're a counselor, maybe a therapist or an analyst. What does this mean for your work? Or we might look at 1 Timothy 6.15. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Here, God's a political ruler. He's a king. Maybe you work in government. What does this mean for your work? All right, maybe you're thinking that this doesn't really matter. Again, it matters a lot. <laughs> Have you ever heard the title of civil servant? What is a civil servant? That's someone who works in the government, right? Well, that title began to be used for government officials in England following the Reformation. You see, up until that time, if you were a king or in the court of a king, in other words, if you were working in government, you were not a servant. In fact, you were just the opposite. You had lots of people serving you, and you lorded it over them. You lorded your authority over them. You commanded, you snapped your fingers, and they responded. So where did this incredibly counterintuitive idea of a government servant come from, or a civil servant? It didn't just fall from the sky. It came from the Bible. And specifically, it came from understanding the kind of ruler that God is and his son Jesus is. Here's the key passage, in fact, Mark 10, 42 through 45. Jesus here is speaking to his disciples, and he said, You know that those who are regarded as the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great must be your servant. So in England, and later in America and around the world, Government officials became known as servants of the people. That's amazing. 
That insight into work came from looking at God and the way he does his work. Now, sadly, we've kind of lost this idea of civil service in the West, and that's part of what we have to fight to recover, but that's why we're here. That's why God has his people in government and in art and in education and in business. We see God working clearly in the account of creation, but is he still working? Yes, his work continues in upholding and sustaining creation. In fact, we see this in Colossians 1, 16 through 17. All things have been created through him, and in him all things hold together. Apart from the sustaining work of God in creation, everything would fall apart. Your very next breath that you breathe is a gift from God. For apart from his holding together the very cells of your lungs you would die. And that's not all. God is working in history now to redeem and restore everything that's been broken through the fall. He's at work in your generation and in your nation. He has this wonderful history encompassing redemptive plan that we're going to look at later that he conceived of, that he initiated, that he's carrying out, and that he will accomplish. Now, just think about that. God plans. He's strategic. He initiates. He's faithful in carrying out his plan. He carries it out until it's complete. So what does that say to us about the way we work and about the importance of things like planning and strategy and careful and faithful execution and determined and dogged perseverance until our work is completed? Not only God the Father works, but God the Son, Jesus Christ, also works. In John 5, 17, Jesus said, My Father is working until now, and I myself am working. In John 4, 34, Jesus said, the food, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now, we think of Christ's work mainly in terms of redemption, and that's right. But in fact, for most of his life, He worked as a blue-collar common laborer. He worked as a carpenter. Think about that. God incarnate had the calloused hands of a skilled laborer. And that gave dignity to all people who work with their hands in carpentry and any other kind of skilled labor. Just think about the kind of chairs and tables and other items that Jesus would have made in his workshop. Wouldn't you love to see them? Wouldn't it be just great to touch them? What were they like? You know, in a way, we can see them because Jesus has inspired many skilled laborers over the centuries who've crafted amazing works of incredible quality and lasting beauty. Lastly, we see the work of the triune God in the Holy Spirit. In 1 Peter 1-2, we read about the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. In Philippians 1-5, Paul said, I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So, if you're a follower of Jesus, God's Spirit is working in you right now, today, to mold you and to shape you and to refine your character so that it begins to reflect Jesus Christ. In the powerful words of Romans 8, 28 through 30, we see this, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who've been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. A biblical understanding of work and vocation has to begin with God himself. And we have to recognize, first of all, that God works. He works in creation and he continues his work in redemption and in sanctification. We learn about our work from him, whether we're in government or we're journalists or fathers or mothers or farmers or counselors or even blue-collar skilled workers. We learn about our work from him. We imitate his creativity. We imitate his love for beauty, his diversity, his planning, his strategizing, his intentionality. And don't forget that we also imitate him in learning to rest from our work. That's something many in my society need to remember. So as you think about your work, I want you to begin by becoming a student of God. 
learn from him about how you should do your work, I'm confident that the results are going to be revolutionary.